honor our A lot of love, so it's harder to go through things when we're alone in it. And so this message this morning is called Coming Home. And there's going to be a lot more to it than just us going home. And we're going to get into that, but let's first focus on that aspect because there's people in this church that are here today that went through extended times of being away from their home, whether it be their physical home with their family or their church home with their family. So the first person I'm going to go to today that has a little word to share is me, Mizrahi. Me, Mizrahi was in the hospital for nearly what, two months in Philadelphia. And it was pretty major. And she was away from her home and her church home. And she has something to share today about that. Um. I want to just say thank you, everyone. Really, um, you are good, my friend and my body, and a lovely, lovely, lovely. Mm. And then the um, next city is my husband. He is the really devoted, really, it's very devoted. So it's really, thank you. Uh, and I really appreciate it for everyone. I came today to confess and program in that in my heart and on my mind, my simple nature is nailed and died on the cross with Jesus Christ. He is alive in my heart and mind. The healing God is doing in me every day is the greatest miracle. If I can do something today, God gives me the power and strength to do it tomorrow. So Jesus said, if you believe, you will see the glory of God, John 11, 40. So God is turning into curse to the blessing. He is the miracle worker. Thank you. Thank you so much, my King. Praise God. It wasn't the same without you being with us, and so we're so blessed to have you part of our, you always were part of our church family by being present with us. Amen. Praise God. Right behind you, I know Gina has been. Oh my goodness. We all look alike. Gina's actually at home watching right now. Oh, she is. Hi, Gina. I know Gina would love to be here with us, but she's gone through a lot herself. But she also has come a long ways. And so we've been believing and praying for her. And so we're going to continue to pray for her that she'll be able to come home to church as well. 
And so good to see you all, though, with us as well. So Praise God. Amen. 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 There's a few other people. One of them back here is John Michael Wright, who we've been praying for so long. We prayed for over a year. So, John Michael Wright, were you, how long were you in the hospital? I was back and forth. For how like long? 18 months. 18 months. And it, it seemed like well, at one it point. A little longer. A little longer. It was like a little after Christmas in 2020. Wow. It seemed at one back point. Back and forth between the hospitals and nursing home. Yep. Did it seem at, at some point it was like you were at the, in a real dark place that it didn't seem good at oh, all? Yeah, it seemed like I didn't even belong there. I was like. Yeah. What's it like to be back home? Uh, better than it was. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, I didn't belong there. And it's great to have you part of our church family as well. So let's just give it up for John Michael Wright. Amen. He's come so far. We as a church family, when you're not with us, we miss you so much. You're always a part of us, whether you're watching us from home, whether you're watching us from a hospital bed, you're still part of us, but it's not the same without you being physically with us. How about Joanne Utt? <laughs> Joanne's normally watching us from home, but now some days she gets the strength to get here and be with us physically, because I know it's not the same, and it's great to have you with us. Amen. 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 How many else, anyone else here has been away from your church family for a while because of sickness or anything? Just stand to your feet. We just want to honor you. Anyone else? There we go. Yep, these two. Gone through a lot. Great to have you with us in person. You know, it's great to have our family online, but when you're with us, it's so much even sweeter. Amen. It's just like when we, we can call our family members on the phone, we can connect with them, but when they're with us in person, it's so much deeper. Thank God for FaceTime and every kind of visual thing that you can use, but there's nothing like somebody being with you. And so that's why we're really going to focus in on today how, yes, we can be apart from each other, but the one thing that we all know God is never apart from us. He is always with us. Because there will be times in life, you know, I've told my wife, I don't want to be away from her anymore. Or my kids. I don't like traveling away from them. I like traveling with them. When I first, when my wife and I just got engaged, just were connected, I had to go on a two-month mission trip away from her. And back then, there was no cell phones. That's a while ago. There was no cell phones and traveling the islands. The way we, I actually had to call her was go to a phone and put change in it. <laughs> Hopefully I had enough change because it was all long distance back then. But what she did was she actually wrote uh, for the 60 days, 60 love letters, each marked with a day that I would bring out that would at least let me let it feel like she was there to some extent by reading those words. But again, what I longed to do was to get back to her. How many of you have been in that place before? Whether you might have served in the military, been in a hospital, been in prison. Hello, a lot of us have been in some places before in here, right? And you just long to come home. Well, Jesus himself left home. He came down to earth, and for 33 years, he was here with us, away from his heavenly home. And then he went through this, the worst suffering anybody could go through, but for us. And then he went into that grave. And here in Acts 1-9, it gives the description of Jesus going back home. It says Acts 1 9. Now, when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up. Basically, he got on a jet plane, but in the spirit, he was taken up. 
and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So Jesus ascended to heaven. But at the same time as he ascended to heaven, he descended gifts upon all creation. That whoever would believe in him, those gifts would come over them and in them. And on Pentecost, Jesus came back through the Holy Spirit in us. So though his physical return will come, he's spiritually with us, in us, always. That's why he told his disciples, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'll be with you through eternity. Because it says in Ephesians 3.17, then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. So Jesus is with us. Even when we're alone, we're not alone. It's hard to be away from family. It's hard to be in those places like a hospital bed or be away as in, the, in the military, away from our family and friends. But yet... Jesus is in us. He's in our heart. We're never fully alone. And so we will all go through in this life suffering and difficult times. Some of us go away to college and it's hard to be away from our family. But yet the one thing we know, we're never alone. He is with us. That's how we get through what we're going through, especially when we're feeling alone, is, oh, yes, Jesus, you're not far from me. You're not the man upstairs. You're in me. You're in my heart. You're with me. Emmanuel, God with us. He is with us. The hidden mystery, Christ in us, the hope of glory. That mystery has been revealed. And so as we go now into the book of Psalms, and it's Psalms 84, we're going to look at the psalm through new covenant eyes. Because what you're going to see here is a longing for home. But we no longer have to long for home because we have our home. Thanks for watching. We are his home. So first of all, who is Psalm 84 being written by? Because to really understand something, you got to know their author and the author's intent. The Psalm 84 is not David's psalm. It's actually the sons of Korah. Now, interesting that they call them the son, sons of Korah because really they were Kohathites. But Korah was somebody in their generations before them that did such evil that they were, they were defined by what their great-great-great-grandfather or whatever had done. The sons of Korah. Some of us are defined by our ancestors of what they've done. Some of us are living in generational curses because of what other people have done, and we have not yet broken them. So who were the sons of Korah? Who is these people that wrote this psalm, Psalm 84? Where the Koathites were responsible for the care of the sanctuary. The Koathites had to carry their items, the holy things of the tabernacle, on their shoulders. Everyone else, all the other people responsible for the, the tabernacle, they carried their items on camels, horses, but these ones just happened to carry them on their shoulders. It was a heavy burden. Some of us were brought into this world and we were born into a heavy burden. It was passed down to us. We might have been born into poverty. We might have been born into a dysfunctional home. So we were born into a difficult place. So we had it rough from the get-go. Can that relate with anybody? Many of the Koathites began to disdain this task and to covet the role of the priests. The priests seemed to have it easy. They kind of just rolled from here to there. They didn't have to carry anything. And so they kind of looked at the priests 
with disdain. Korah was the grandson of Kohath, and he began to run with another group of Reubenites, Reubenite malcontents, some malcontents. Watch out who you hang around. If you hang around people that are malcontent, discontent, people that are always complaining and always upset, guess what? You're going to be always upset and always complaining. Right. Namely, Dothan and Abiram, sons of Eliab and On, son of Peleth. In pride, they roused a group of 250 men together to challenge the right of Moses and Aaron. What happened when they challenged the right of Moses and Aaron? All of a sudden, the earth opened up. Nobody had to dig a grave for them. God dug the grave for them, and they were swallowed into the ground. This is the earth is going to swallow us too, so those who were connected to them. See, we can just be associated with somebody and go down with them. We didn't commit the act, but we were associated with them. The earth's going to swallow us too, and the fire, this time the earth didn't swallow them, but the fire of God came out and burned them alive. So the sons, of, the, some of the sons of Korah weren't sucked up though. God's mercy, they lived. This generation continued, and over time, they still had a place, even though they were defined as the sons of Korah. They were defined by their past. They were defined by generations of mistakes from other people. Some of us, again, are defined by the mistakes of other people, not even our own mistakes. Yeah. The Korites became doorkeepers. So from carrying the items to now opening the door. And custodians, they were custodians of the tabernacle. Still not priests. Still not any so-called seemingly important task or role. But they weren't sucked up by the earth. They were alive. But during the time of King David, they became the great leader. See, something about David. David had a heart after God. And when you have a heart after God, you begin to see people as God sees them. When our heart is after God, we begin to see people. You see potential in people. You see the down and outs, those who have been written out, have been put to the side, and you see potential in them. So David saw potential in these ones, and he made them and gave them a place of honor. They became the worship leaders in the house of God. The tabernacle at that time was in Bethel. Bethel is defined as the house of God. So they were worshipers now for King David at the house of God, and they were worship leaders. Amen. Suddenly they became from doorkeepers to worship leaders, though doorkeeping isn't anything less than either. But David saw their gift to sing. And so 11 psalms are written by the sons of Korah. Amazing story. So now let's go into their psalm, Psalm 84, and understand this psalm again through new covenant eyes. Because a lot of what we read about in the old covenant, just like I was celebrating yesterday, Passover Seder, and it was great to see and go through the different customs and traditions, but they all reflect not what we're hoping for, but what we now have. So we celebrate it today. If you celebrate the feasts and you celebrate these things, you can celebrate it in a whole different way than those who don't yet know that Jesus has already come. He is the Messiah. If you don't know that, you're still looking for something to come. But we now look to the one who has come, who came and is with us. So the first verse here in Psalm 84 says, How lovely is your dwelling place O oh Lord of heaven's armies. How lovely is your dwelling place, O oh Lord of heaven's armies. How many of you have encountered a manifest presence of God in a gathering such as this? In a gathering 
together of God's people in a church building. How many of you have experienced that presence where you don't want to leave, where you want to linger, where you want to remain, you want to stay a while because it feels so good, because what comes with it is, is this overwhelming er, um, surge of peace and surge of power. You feel this love that comes over you, this joy unspeakable that's running all over. You don't want to leave it. Because there's something special when God's people worship together. We can worship God, of course, every day, everywhere, all the time. But when we come together, we supply grace to each other. We all offer something. So when we offer worship to God together, all of our offerings are poured out at the same time. And therefore, there's a greater outpouring than when we're home alone. God meets us home alone, but he meets us in a special way when we're here. So how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord, when you have tasted and seen how good God is, when you've experienced his manifest presence, when, he's, when it's not just head knowledge, but when it's life, living life flowing in you and through you, then you see what the son of Korah is talking about. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord, the Lord of heaven's armies. I long, yes, I faint with longing to enter the courts of the Lord. I long, yes, I faint with longing. Just like when you were in that hospital bed and you long to get home. Just like when I was traveling in, in um, Antigua and, and Barbados and, and even the little touch in Trinidad and St. Kitts and Nevis and Guyana when I was traveling these places, but my wife was in St. Croix. I was longing to get back to St. Croix. Just like Pastor Romain and his precious wife are longing to see change happen in Haiti, to go back to Haiti and see Haiti changed, where you can actually be at home and be at peace. There's longings that we have to be in certain places. For the sons of Kor, they long to be in the courts of the Lord. With my whole being, my body and my soul. Have you ever felt that where your whole, you, you just can't wait. You've ever been at an airport when your family's there to greet you as you come home from somewhere? And they greet you with those, you know, or you observe other people and you see them, especially you observe somebody coming from the military home. And their family waiting for them and that greeting them and the crying and the tears that flow out when you see them come home. Yeah. I will shout joyfully to the living God. Amen. That's what we do. We shout joyfully when our loved ones come home. How about if we look to church the same way? I love to be in the court of the Lord. I love to come together with the saints and worship God because there's such a presence. There's so great power. But at the same time, do we understand the revelation that we are the courts of the Lord? That we are the dwelling place of God? That he dwells in us? You know, I, I remember Pastor Roger and I, when we did our little trip to Greece, and when we especially went to... Um, uh, what was the beautiful place with the white buildings and what is it called? The place. Beautiful place. <laughs> what is it? One of the top destinations in Greece. Santorini. So when you're in Santorini, we're walking through the streets, even this beautiful church, Greek Orthodox church probably, the, the courts were just amazing, just beautiful. You just want to sit and just worship God and, and pray and seek him in these beautiful courts. Some of us have beautiful homes with beautiful courts where you just have your secret time with the Lord. You get alone, those beautiful places, and you long to be in that place. But that place is actually in us too. Wherever we're at, even in the midst of busyness and noise around us, the courts of the Lord are in us. We are his dwelling place. When you get that revelation and experience it, when you believe it, it changes you. It allows you to have peace at all times. 
It allows you to walk in joy no matter what's going on around you because the courts of the Lord is within you. So even though you're far from home or far from wherever, you're in a place that you would rather not be, but yet when you remember that the courts of the Lord are in you, when God is with you, you can rejoice. It says here in verse 3, even the sparrow finds a home. And the swallow builds her nest and raises her young at a place near your altar. O Lord of heaven's armies, my king and my God. The sparrow symbolizes that which is seemingly insignificant. And some of us might have felt insignificant. We don't feel like we're that important. We're not that special. We don't have that many gifts. We don't have much to share. We're not somebody that's on a stage. We're just insignificant. People don't notice us often. We haven't accomplished much. We don't feel like we have much value, much worth. But even as the sparrow finds his home, we all have a home in Christ Jesus. We're all significant in him. We're all valuable in him. We're all important in him. We can put our hand up to those in the world who think anything any different or anybody even in the church who thinks any different. We are special. We are beloved. God is no respecter of persons. He loves me just as much as he loves you. Now, he does love my wife more than anyone else. But. But we're all his favorites. All of us. We're all special. We all have a place. We're all important. You know that's what most people in this world are looking for? Amen. Just longing to be appreciated, longing to feel important, longing to have a place, longing to be recognized. We have that place. We are a family. Amen. We're all Loved and appreciated. You are needed. I need you. You need me. We all need each other. You might not even yet know what's inside of you. You might even know what you're bringing to the table. But God is using you. By your presence, things flow out of you in the spirit that you don't even realize. God is invisible, and a lot of his work is happening in the, in the invisible realm around us. There's angels in our midst. The Spirit of God is moving. He's moving through you. Just like we saw the rivers, we all have a river flowing out of us. Therefore, the river flowing out of us is touching the person next to you. If they need, a little, they need to go a little deeper in the river, and you're carrying a deeper level than they are at, by them being near you, Suddenly they're being drawn closer and deeper. You're drawing them deeper just because you showed up, just because you sat next to them, just because you're around them. The river of living water is flowing out of you. You might not be the one giving the message today. You might not have been the, on the team singing a song, worshiping the Lord, but just because you showed up, people are being touched by your very presence. The presence of our God. Nothing like his presence. Look at what it says here. What joy, in verse 4 and 5, for those who can live in your house, always singing your praises. What joy for those whose strength comes from the Lord, who have set their minds on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. So what's happening here was three times a year, the children of Israel from all over the nation of Israel would make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to celebrate the feasts. And it was a long, a lot of Israel was desert. So they had a long trek through desert land where it was hot. But they longed to be there. But we do live in the house of the Lord. You don't have to wait for Sunday morning. We are the house of the Lord. He dwells in us he is with us. The Bible says to praise the Lord when? On Sunday morning? At all times. Praise ye the Lord. Praise shall continually be out of our mouth. When praises go up, blessings come down. Praise brings forth an atmosphere. 
so we can change atmospheres by our praise. That's what we're called to do, to change this world. Because Jesus went up to heaven, but you, did you know that Jesus really didn't just go home? He came down here to reestablish his home. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. God created this earth as a habitation of heaven. And because of sin, it was lost. But when Jesus went into that grave, what did he do? He stole back the keys. He took back. He didn't have to steal it. He took back what was his. He took back the keys. And because the keys are now in his hand, this home, earth, is now his. Amen. And we get to be part of it. We get to be part of his mansion. So we don't have to just go to Jerusalem, though Pam and Lori will be there in a few days. And that's great to go there. I've been there. It's nice. I'm going to go there again. But the holy Jerusalem is also in us. God is in us. Heaven is in us. Heaven and earth have become one through the Spirit. When Jesus went up, the Spirit came down. Because the Spirit came down, heaven and earth that were separated now became one. When they walk through the valley of weeping, it will become a place of refreshing springs. The autumn rains will clothe it with blessings. So in this desert place, in the midst of their pilgrimage to Jerusalem, there is a place called Baca, the, or Baca, B-A-C-A, the place of weeping, the valley of weeping. And a lot of us are going through the valley of weeping. We have a hard time not going through our day without crying because of what's going on in our lives, what's going on in our family, what's going on in the people close to us. So we're in the valley of weeping. But what does it say here? In the midst of the valley of weeping, when we turn our eyes to God, when we look within us, because there's a well inside of each of us, there's a living well. So when we go through a dry time in our life, how do we get refreshed? We just look within. The well is within. Living well, living waters. Everywhere the children of Israel would go and set up camp, they would bring forth a well. Bethel had a well. All these different places had a well. There was a place to go to get water, to get refreshed from the hot desert. But we have a well. We don't have to go through seasons. We don't even have to go through the wilderness. The moment we got born again, we could step right into the promised land. We can drink from the well. We don't have to stay in the desert. We don't have to stay weeping. What does it say? Weeping may for a night. A night. Just a night. But joy comes in the morning. So we'll have temporary displeasures, temporary challenges, temporary difficulties. But we don't have to remain there. The moment we realize, oh yes, I can drink from within. God has given me refreshing right here. He's with me. Lord, I thirst for you. Now I drink from you. They will continue to grow stronger. We're growing stronger. The word for the, the year, 2023, that, I, that the elders, leaders of the church felt was this is a year to be strong in the Lord. Why? Because we're going to face some things. But this year is a year to get even stronger. If you were strong in 2022, the word this year is to get stronger. If you were weak, it's time to get strong. It's time to even get stronger. Every day it's an opportunity to get stronger. When we get in the word, we get stronger. When we go before the presence of God, he has something fresh to give us today. There's new manna every day, so there's something to strengthen and nourish us every single day. They will continue to grow stronger, and each of them will appear before God in Jerusalem. See, they needed strength for the journey to get to Jerusalem. They were tired. They were weary. They had these wells to drink from along the way, but they also needed the, the strength to get there. Jesus, one of the things we learned yesterday at the Passover, 
was the, the, the angel that strengthened Jesus when he was about to go upon that cross. It was a long journey, and he would not have had the strength naturally in of himself to get to the place Golgotha. And so the angel came to give him strength, because as a human, he needed that, spirit, that supernatural strength to endure what he was going through. We're all going to go through times that we need supernatural strength. Whatever strength we think we have in of ourselves will not be enough. I got this. No, you don't. I'll handle this. No, you won't. You're going to be okay. You might not be. People love to say that to comfort people. You're only going to be okay if you turn it all over to God. You're only going to get through it if, if Jesus is your answer. If you're going to stand on truth, we can't say that. Don't give people false hope. You're talking to a person who is walking in rebellion and you say everything's going to be okay. It's not going to be okay. It's going to get worse. You don't have the strength to get through what you're going through. The only way we have the strength to get through what we're going through is if our strength comes from God. And how do we get strength in God? In his presence is the fullness of joy, and the joy of the Lord is our strength. What marks somebody that they're walking with God? The two areas that mark that they're walking with God, as we see according to Scripture, is that those who walk with God, walk in his presence, walk with joy, and walk with strength. That's what we walk in. When you walk with joy and strength, you walk with your head up. You walk with confidence. Whatever life throws at you, you know God got it. You no longer have to fear no more. You no longer have to back up. You continue forward because you know whom you're serving and who is with you and who is in you. A single day in your courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. I would rather be a gatekeeper in the house of my God than live the good life in the homes of the wicked. See, now we understand where the sons of Korah were coming from. They did serve God in the courthouse. They were the doorkeepers. And at different periods of time, they were away from the tabernacle and they longed to come back to it because that was their place that they loved to be, serving God. I love, actually, one of my favorite things to do, especially when I'm not preaching, I, I usually stand in the back and I open the door because I love seeing you guys. I love looking at your eyes. I love shaking your hands. I like connecting with our family. I like being a doorkeeper, <laughs> opening the door. But spiritually, we're all doorkeepers. Jesus is the door, but we're his body. He is in us. We're the door to God through Jesus in us. We are the ones who draw people. What my prayer was for each of you today is that God would use me to draw you closer to him. And if you have not yet stepped into that door, that you step into that door today. We are the doorkeepers. People find that God is real through us. By our very nature, that God's nature in us, by the power of God that flows through us, people are seeing the door. They're in darkness. They're lost. And suddenly they see a door. They see a way out. They see light. We can show people the way out. Have you ever been lost somewhere? How frightening it is to be lost? And you just need to find a way out? We get to be to the world the way out. Amen. That's why in this next series that I'm going to be teaching called Gone Fishing, the focus is all going to be about being in the world, to draw the world, Amen. to draw them. They need to find a way out. They need to see the light. If they don't see the light, how do they know the way? So we're the doorkeepers. We're the gatekeepers. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. When you have that divine protection over your life, when you know, when you know that you know that you know God is with you, I mean, we got to catch this revelation. you got to know for yourself. Let today be a day, this Resurrection Sunday, that you know for sure, not just by theology, not just by your mind, but you know that you know that you know that Jesus is resurrected and that he is living inside of you.
That you can feel his power right now flowing through you. The lights have been turned on. See, we want nothing left in our life. It's like buying a home that somebody else used. What are you going to do? You're going to clean it out. You're going to make sure every room is cleaned out of the old person that once lived there. Because you want a new person. The new person, you want it to be all reflecting you. So you're now going to fill it up with what you bring. Some of us still have old stuff in our life that doesn't belong. We gave our keys. That's what we need to do today. If you have not yet given your life to Jesus, it's like giving him your home, saying, you know what, I tried to take care of this home and I couldn't. I didn't do a good job. This home is, is a mess. And I, I need somebody to clean up this mess. Jesus, I'm giving you the keys to my home. I want you to come into this home. And some of us have given Jesus some of the keys, but every room has a key. And we still have some rooms that we're holding on to some of those keys. We have some hidden stuff in our life, some dark areas. He's not filling our life with his goodness. Because look at what it says here. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk is blameless. When we allow Jesus to inhabit our entire life, our life is filled with his good things. If we have wants still in our life, if we have things that are missing in our life, if we have things that we don't still haven't yet grabbed a hold of, it might be because we have hidden areas in our life that we haven't yet surrendered. When Jesus fills our life, our life is filled with his goodness. When you really walk with God and you experience his goodness, I was just reflecting on this this morning. When you see the good things in God poured out over your life, there's nothing like it. And it's just like a parent who wants their children to do well. If you could force them to do well, when you see them going off the right path, when you see them choose, making bad decisions, you want to take a hold of them. But they get to an age where they now get to choose for themselves. And you can't force them. But as a pastor, if I could force each of you to surrender your entire life to God, to let go of it all, to get healed of all hurts, of all pain, to, to allow the Lord to set you free of all generational curses, to be completely delivered, to see all addictions leave your body, to get to that place where you give God your all, I would do it. If I could shake it into you, if I could punch it into you, if I could, you know, just throw all of God into you, I would. But it's from our choice. It's from our free will. That's how we're different from every other creation. We have been given free will. And so today, while it's today, do not harden your hearts. Like the children of Israel did in the wilderness. It says in Hebrews, while it's open, while your heart is opening in this atmosphere, in this place, give your life to Jesus. And if you haven't given your life to Jesus or you've given some of your life to Jesus, it's not enough. Give all your life to Jesus. Just like if you buy a new home and you have a party to dedicate that home to God, today is a day of rededication. Rededication ceremony. We have a special song. I'm going to have the worship team come up. The song is called Running Home. Just like the prodigal son... The son started running home, and while he was running, the father didn't just stand there waiting for him to get to him. The father started running to him. And so we need to run to our father. And again, this is not just for non-believers, those who are not saved. This is for those who haven't fully allowed Jesus to inhabit our entire being. I encourage you to run to the altar today. As you run, God will meet you. And you're not just running home. You're really running for God to make his home in you. Let us worship. Amen. If you can, stand to your feet. Come to the altar. I really encourage you. Let's worship the Lord.
How we doing? Everybody all right? Good word, Josh. Thank you. How many know worship isn't a spectator sport? It's not a spectator sport. Amen. You got to enter in. The person next to you is depending on you to sing and to clap. Amen. That's what Josh just said. They're depending on you to show up. Let's sing it like it's our last time here on earth. Amen. Amen. One, two, three, four. I'm 
He called my name. Well, he called my name. Praise the Lord. Let's obey that song, that command of that song. If you have not given your life to Jesus, come to this altar right now. Let today be the day that you come home. Come to this altar. If you are someone that has backslidden, you played the prodigal son, come to the altar. If you just want to rededicate your life, you want more Jesus in your life, you want him to fill your home with his life, come to this altar. Let Resurrection Day be a special day in your life, a changed day in your life. I encourage you, come forward now, run home. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The rest of you, God bless you. Have a wonderful Resurrection Day. But the altars are now open. Come on up and come home in Jesus' name. God bless you. Thanks for watching. Yes, my sister. If you enjoyed the service and you want to learn more about the ministry, head over to the website at praisetabernacle.church where you can learn about all the ministries Praise has to offer. Find devotional content, weekly newsletters from the pastors, and much more. We hope to see you soon right here at Praise Tabernacle because we are people restored and inspired serving everywhere.